So, uh, Mathias Fink is a professor at the USPC in Paris. He holds the Georges Charpak uh, chair over there. His research focuses mainly on the wave physics uh, in complex media. Uh, during his PhD, he worked on the development of the first high resolution real time medical ultrasound imager in 1978. In 1981, he became a professor at the University of Strasbourg. He spent time at the University of Irvine in California in the Department of Radiology. And returning from the US, he joined the ESPC uh, in Paris and created the Laboratoire Onde Acoustique, which is known today as the Institut Langevin, an institute that focuses on waves and imaging. His findings have given rise to the creation of six innovative companies that employ over 400 people. He has supervised over 60 PhDs, co-authored more than 400 scientific papers and over 70 patents. He has supervised over six, uh, sorry, he was elected a member of the prestigious Académie des Sciences in 2003 and is the first academic to have been appointed at the Collège de France on the Technological Innovation Chair in 2008. We are very happy to receive Mathias today, who has kindly accepted to serve as our senior speaker for the first session of our webinars. So Mathias, the floor is yours. Actually, there is no floor here, so I should say the, the network is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Alexandre, and thank you, Philippe, to, to propose me to give this uh, lecture. Uh, it's uh, quite special because I will come back on what uh, Julio present, but I will try to put a lot of physics in it because I have more time. And I will tell you a little bit the story of all this uh, spatial temporal uh, metamaterial or material, in fact. It is not always metamaterial, but because today people love metamaterial, we speak of metamaterial. Uh, let us begin first by some paper uh, that I used to, to prepare this talk. Uh, there is a, a set of paper by the group of uh, Pendry uh, that are very similar on this gain mechanism in time dependent media that I put in red. Uh, as Julio say, uh, in fact, the story has begun very long time ago. It was in the microwave community in the 50 that people tried to develop a microwave amplifier and all this complex all this idea of traveling wave parametric amplifier came at this time. And there are very good paper at this time on this problem. Uh, there is also a nice series of paper that I put in blue by uh, Christophe Callos uh, that tried to, to make a general theory of space-time metamaterial and the paper are quite interesting, a little bit difficult to read sometimes, but interesting. And I put also in black two papers from Langevin Institute on this kind of idea in the field of water wave. And I will show you, in fact, some experiments with water wave because it's helped really to understand the physics of all this problem. Uh, let us begin by uh, the simplest things, uh, a space material. All of you know this space material. Uh, here I put the material which is 1D, made of a series of periodic, a series of small uh, blocks. Uh, each block uh, is composed of at least two parts with two different refractive index for any kind of wave. And uh, when you have a series of these blocks, uh, you can think in terms of one block, uh, which is uh, made of N1, N2, and after N1, uh, but you can call the Fabry Perot resonator. And you know that the property of the Fabry Perot resonator is that because there are uh, change in refractive index, there are reflected waves, and you can have multiple reflection between re reflected waves and transmitted waves. And when you put all these blocks together, uh, things are more complicated, but uh, the mathematics is simple. It's a kind of matrix that you multiply one by one, and you can have constructive interference between periodic reflection. And you know that the concept of bond gap is completely related to the idea of what people call Bragg scattering. Uh, when you look all the reflected wave, when all these reflected wave are in phase, you are able to have a very strong reflected wave. That is to say, 
nothing is really going inside the media. And bond gap is nothing else but uh, uh, due to uh, constructive interference of reflected wave. And in some cases, it is so spectacular that practically a wave cannot penetrate in the material very far. This is space material. Now, you can also imagine time material, that is to say a medium where the refractive index is the same everywhere in space, but it is changing periodically in time. And now you can also try to understand how a wave propagates in some, such a medium. The medium is infinite in size, but refractive index change periodically. And to understand what happened in this case, you have to understand what means reflection in time and transmission in time. And the key is to understand what is reflection in time. And uh, you can ask, did all reflection in time can interfere uh, to keep my wave or to amplify my wave? And you will see that in this kind of time material, because there is no more energy conservation, you can have in the band gap, a regime where a wave, instead of becoming um, smaller and smaller, that is to say evanescent, it is the contrary. The wave becomes bigger and bigger, and it is amplification. And it is the key of time material. Now, what is interesting is to see what happens when you have a space-time material, and you have a grating that moves at some velocity here, it is just a progressive wave, but as somebody asked, it may be more complicated. And you can ask, what is space-time reflection uh, in this kind of material? Uh, with this in mind, I want to add something important. Usually people, they speak of refractive index and variation of refractive index that is uh, uh, enough to create reverse wave or uh, reflection, reflection, but in fact, it is not really all the time refractive index that is important. What is really important is the uh, impedance of the wave that has to change to have reflection. And as you know, for example, for electromagnetic wave, uh, you can have uh, different velocity in the medium uh, if you have different refractive index, but there are cases where even the velocity is different uh, you will have no reflection. Why? Because you have to take into account what is the impedance, which is the ratio of mu over epsilon. And if mu1 over epsilon1 equal mu2 over epsilon2, there is no reflection. And uh, this is important for what I will uh, speak after. Usually I will speak of discontinuity in refractive index, if you are with a dielectric where you change only epsilon uh, because you don't change mu, in this case, you can guarantee what when the refractive index change, there is reflection. But if you have a medium which is not only dielectric but magnetic also, uh, you can play with this uh, to kill the reflection. And if you kill the uh, reflection, you killed all the mechanism that give rise to bond gap. And I will come back on this later. Now, uh, if you want to come back on the very simple example of a space interface, you have uh, two parts in your medium with two refractive index, N1 and N2. And here you show a space-time diagram. And I will focus a lot on one theorem, which is very well known in physics, which is the Notaire theorem, that tell you that depending on the symmetry of your problem, you have conservation law. And for each symmetry, there is a, a conservation law. And if you come here in a medium where you have two refractive index, which are different, epsilon one and mu one, uh, you can look the dispersion relation that you have for the two medium and that I present here in this plot. For a plane wave, you have the velocity in medium one, velocity in medium two. And now if you think in terms of causality, you send an incident wave uh, that uh, arrive at this interface, what happened? If you look here, what happened 
by sending a wave at one frequency omega one k one, it is like you begin with an incident wave that is a point on the dispersion relation that I put here. Now, because you are in a medium where everything uh, stay, is stationary, nothing changes in time, you have energy conservation. You know that the two waves you will produce will have the same energy, uh, that is to say the same frequency. Uh, in this case, that because you have uh, a discontinuity in space, you have no more uh, momentum conservation, that is to say the wave, wave vector is not conserved. This tells you that in this case, when you have an incident wave, it's created two waves, a transmitted wave, which is at the same frequency, but with a different k vector, and a reflected wave, uh, which is well known at the same frequency. This is very classical. This is just a space interface uh, between two medium, uh, and you have conservation of omega. Now, imagine that you are looking uh, the dual problem of a temporal interface. You send a wave in a medium, uh, which is, for example, at one frequency omega one k one, and at one time, suddenly you change the refractive index, but, and the medium is infinite. That is to say, you have, in this case, uh, wave vector conservation, because there is no discontinuity in space, but you have no more energy conservation. And this tells you that in this case, if you have a, an incident wave, it will give rise to two waves, one uh, at the same k vector, one is the forward wave that continues in the same direction, but it has changed frequency. Omega two is different from omega one, and the ratio between the two is written here. And you have what is the most important in the temporal interface. You have the reflected wave in the temporal interface, which is in fact a wave that oscillates at frequency minus omega two. Like you have k2 and minus k2 uh, in space reflection. Here you have omega2 and omega and minus omega2. What it, does it mean, this minus omega2? It means that uh, you have a wave that is a phase conjugated wave of the incident wave, but it oscillates at a frequency omega2, which is different from omega1. It is a kind of uh, phase conjugated wave, except the frequency is shift. Just a point here, when you put omega one, it gives you a wave that is reverse in phase, but oscillate at, minus, at omega two. But if you have a broad bomb pulse with many frequency here, you will have for each of these omega one frequency, a minus omega two contribution, and it will create a time reverse wave, uh, but with some expansion factor. That is to say, it is not a pure phase conjugation where you create from omega one minus omega one, you create minus omega two. And this is just an interface. If you want to create a perfect time reverse wave, that is to say, a wave that oscillates at minus omega one uh, instead of omega one, you have to create a fabry perot resonator in the time domain. And a fabry perot resonator in the time domain uh, is made of a series of change of refractive index to change. You send a wave, for example, a plane wave at one frequency. You change suddenly the velocity in the medium. It creates two waves, one omega two, one minus omega two. And after you want to come back to the first N1, like this, if you come back to the first N1, you will come back to the same frequency omega one and uh, that the incident frequency. But because it's a Fabry Perot, it's created at the second uh, change, also two wave, here two wave, and here you can see this here, you send an incoming wave, uh, it will create two phase conjugated wave uh, here at the same frequency that the incoming wave, and it will create two forward wave at the same frequency that the incoming wave. And 
to do this, you have to put some energy to change the refractive index. And here, if you call tau uh, this time, you can play with all the uh, Fresnel uh, law for the transmit and reflection between uh, medium one and two. And you can look what happened for the energy that you have uh, after this fabri perot change. You have sent some energy here that you, uh, one, and you look what is the energy you have now. And what you found is that this system is an amplifier because the energy that is going out, one part is a forward wave, uh, but the energy is one plus this factor. And you see that in the backward wave, that is a kind of time reverse wave, you have also the same energy, but what you add here. There is no more energy conservation. And what is important is that if you look the K vector you have here and the K vector you have here, the momentum between the forward and backward wave are perfectly compensated. That is to say, you are uh, in a regime where K uh, has no change because you have an infinite medium. And this physics is very important to understand here because it is the key of many things. Now, uh, when you play with this uh, fabri perot resonator, uh, I call this a frustrated fabri perot because in a classical fabri perot in space, uh, when you have an incoming wave, you have multiple reflection uh, and multiple transmission. Here, in a temporal fabri perot, uh, at each interface, you have only two waves, one forward, one backward, and after each of them would give you two waves. But it is not the same cascade that here. Uh, it is the frustrated cascade because uh, uh, causality don't allow you to come back like this uh, the time axis. Now, what is interesting is to see uh, what happens when you have a Fabri Perot whose duration become very small. Uh, we call this a non-adiabatic process. You try to have a very short Fabri Perot in time with a time duration which is most thinner than the period of the wave you are sending in it. And what, what happened in this case? And uh, did the two backward wave give you a nice time reverse wave? Did the two forward wave give you a nice forward wave? And how can I play with this? And to play with this, with Emmanuel Faure and Vincent Baco, uh, we have pushed things with water wave. Uh, water wave are a nice domain of physics and people were studying uh, nice things like Faraday instability and things like this, but they never speak of wave really. Uh, it is more hydronidamic concept. And we try to revisit many things of water wave in the context of uh, things of temporal variation of refractive index. For example, if you look, uh, water in a shallow uh, water tank uh, where the elevation is not too big. And if you look, uh, the equation for the elevation of water, uh, you can uh, see that first, what makes the wave move is a restoring force, which is gravity. Uh, when you try to change the height of the wave, gravity would try to reverse the phenomena. And if you neglect capillary and viscous effect, if you work in shallow water and if you linearize all this, you have a kind of equation for the elevation of your water wave, which is a kind of d'Alembert equation. It's a big approximation. And you have a velocity for water wave that depends of two things, g, gra the gravitational acceleration, and h, the elevation of your tank. And because you have this, it is not very complicated to change the celerity of the wave very fast. Why? Because Einstein tells us that there is a beautiful theorem, which is called the equivalence principle in general relativity, that tell you that to change gravity, that the best thing is just to create an acce a vertical acceleration of your water tank. If you create suddenly a vertical acceleration of your water tank, you, you add a vertical acceleration, it will change during this time, the gravitational acceleration. And 
it is easy to change gravity. Uh, you have a, a small water tank, you have a big shaker here. Uh, you put an object on water, it creates a water wave, and suddenly you create a vertical acceleration during a very small amount of time. G go from G to G plus gamma G. And if you are able to create a very short duration uh, kick uh, that you call the delta function, which is the limit of a rectangular Fabry-Perot, uh, but you make this change in a very small amount of time. Uh, if you make this experiment in a small water tank that you see here, you have your shaker and you, you create a source of a wave with another shaker of with an object that fall on it and suddenly you shake vertically and you create a vertical acceleration here in fact the acceleration is negative it is minus 20 g which is huge but it has a very small duration to compare to the wave that you can send on your uh, water tank and if you play this you you create here a wave and now you, you shake and what you see in your water tank is that the wave you have created that were propagating suddenly because there was a very short kick that creates a temporal Fabry Perot, ultra brief, it creates a time reverse wave and you found your object that has created the original wave, it's come back. And you can put energy in this that depend on how strong is your Fabry Perot. Uh, change and this depends on how many g you put in the vertical acceleration. Now, if you have this in mind, uh, you can go one step more. Uh, you can say, okay, when I have a Fabry Perot in the time domain, it is just a small shock with small duration. What happens if I create many shocks periodically? <coughs> What happens if I change my velocity during a small amount of time and if I have some time periodicity? And in fact, when I am doing this, I create a periodic time modulation, but it is not a sinusoidal time modulation. It is like what people call in um, quantum physics a, a chronic Pene potential because it is a series of small Dirac, if you want, that change. Uh, things. And here it is very important to understand the physics behind, behind this. Imagine that you have <coughs> a sinusoidal wave that propagates in your bath, uh, a progressive sinusoidal wave. Suddenly, at one time, you create a first shot, the first Fabry Perot resonator during a small amount of time. You understand that. Because of this, this incoming wave now gives rise to two waves. One is a time reverse wave, and one is a forward wave. There are add to this first wave. Now, these two waves, one is the time reverse wave, the other is the forward wave. Each of them move at a speed which is two times the speed of one wave, because each of them go in different directions. Now, when you wait a time t over two uh, compared to this period, after a time t over two, these two waves are in phase. And if you give a second kick at this time, uh, you will create a constructive interference. And if you continue by creating kick every t over two, all this time reverse reflected wave plus the forward wave will make constructive interference together. And after some time, if you have many kick, you create a huge stationary wave compared to your initial wave. And in this case, uh, you begin with a progressive wave and you create now a standing wave that increase, increase, increase as you give many uh, kick. There is no more energy conservation, you add in wave. And of course, you see this ratio of two between uh, the period of the kick and the, and the period of the wave, which is uh, 
amplify. And people call this, in fact, Faraday instability. They never speak, uh, uh, they does not give usually this interpretation in time reverse wave, but this is what happened in fact. And in fact, in Faraday instability, people uh, as the water tank shaker, and instead of giving, giving a very short kick, they prefer to give sinusoidal uh, variation of G, and they create a gravity which is G plus B0 cosine of omega T. And in fact, doing this is very similar than the coding Pene potential, but it is a sinusoidal modulation and it gives uh, another equation to be solved, which is the mature equation. But the phenomena is the same. And if at each kick that you give, you put uh, energy that compensates for the viscosity of the wave because you have viscosity, you can, beginning by having a bath where you have practically no wave, just noise, you have always a noise, uh, a white noise on water surface. And when you are oscillating your bath, it will select the wave that is the Faraday wave at the good frequency and the good K vector. And you will see from nothing the bath uh, beginning when you oscillate and you see a structure that appears and that is amplified. And this is called Faraday instability and it is nothing else than parametric amplification. Parametric amplification need that when you give each periodic kick, you create time reverse wave and forward wave and the two interfere together. Uh, just to conclude on V, when you compare what is called a Bragg reflector, which is spatial reflection, a Bragg, a Bragg reflector, you send an incident wave, you have a periodic medium in space, energy is conserved, and you know that when the uh, wavelength of your incident wave is two times <coughs> the periodicity of your Bragg reflector, there is a beautiful reflected wave. And in fact, the solution in the gap is an evanescent wave because you have energy conservation. Now, if you do the same, but in the time domain, what I call the Bragg time mirror, uh, very, the big difference is that you have no more energy conservation and the Bragg scattering between spatial reflection is replaced by a Bragg scattering, which is nothing else that generate time reverse wave. I call this time reverse reflected wave and they interfere constructively with forward wave. And in this case, because you have no energy conservation, you will have a solution that can grow. Uh, and it is what is called parametric amplification. Now, when I say this, uh, this was for water wave, I can come back on electromagnetic wave and- Sorry, Mathias. Mathias. I'm sorry, Mathias, can I just interrupt you with a small uh, question concerning uh, yeah. the examples that you were giving on the uh, water tank? You said yeah. that uh, you can uh, change the gravity with uh, your apparatus. Uh, can you synthesize uh, G that is zero, actually? Like like uh, what you do with uh, atomic yeah, gravity yeah, yeah, tests, yeah. and what I happens think... then? Do you stop propagation? Uh, no, 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 no. If you do this, well, we have not tried to go in a satellite in a, uh, to play with zero gravity. But, but uh, what I say is valid, even if G become negative. And in fact, the best experiments that were done by uh, Vincent Baco and Emmanuel Faure were when instead of putting a vertical acceleration, uh, it, it's a downward, it's a vertical acceleration, but it's a downward. Uh, and uh, you, uh, there is no problem. You, you can choose. W what is important is to change G uh, very quickly. I understand what you, you say. You say that when there is no G, uh, there is no velocity. Uh, and, uh, but in fact, the wave equation, when I write the wave equation, it was a big simplification of what you have in, in hydrodynamics. Yeah. Um, well, I, I prefer not to comment too much on this because uh, 
uh, at the end of my talk, we can come back on this. Okay, that's fine. No problem. Okay. okay. Now let us come back on electromagnetic wave. Here, I just put a medium which is or vacuum or a dielectric media. That is to say, I will play only on epsilon, not on mu. Uh, I can have at least three, four cases. One is a medium where epsilon is uniform in space and time, one where epsilon is modulated in space. This is a kind of uh, photonic crystal, one where epsilon is modulated in time, one where it is both modulated in space and time. And I want to come back on what characterizes the wave. Wave uh, in a medium where you have energy conservation and wave vector conservation, that is to say a medium which is uniform, you know that the two good quantum number or the two good uh, things are omega frequency, which is conserved, and k, which is conserved. And to characterize a wave, you can characterize by dispersion relation. And the dispersion relation in a uniform medium uh, is this kind of curve, which has some symmetry due to time reversal symmetry. Omega of k is equal to omega minus k. This is uniform medium in space and time. Now, if you have a medium which is only spatially periodic, where you have g as a reciprocal lattice constant that depends on the periodicity in space. Uh, epsilon is written like this. And in this case, because nothing changes in time, you have energy conservation. And because you have a periodicity for epsilon, uh, your potential is periodic, you have a block theorem that tells you that the waves, the solution for a wave. The function is a periodic. Hello? Yes. Uh, the solution is the product of a plane wave, like the plane wave you have here, but the plane wave is multiplied by a periodic function, uh, which has the periodicity of G here. And you have another theorem which is important coming from this, that now omega of k uh, become periodic in k, and it's equal to omega of k plus n, any uh, uh, number uh, uh, of g. And because of this, you have to replace this dispersion relation by a dispersion relation be that becomes periodic with a periodicity with, with which is given by G. Uh, this is when alpha, the modulation is very small. You have just a periodic medium, but with a very small perturbation of periodicity, but it's give you suddenly from this, you go to this. But now if you grow alpha, uh, when you grow alpha, you grow the reflection coefficient that you have, uh, for your refractive index. The refractive index change more, but it's a reflected wave become more and more big. And this creates Bragg scattering and this creates slowly the band gap because uh, at some frequency, the wave, uh, all the reflected wave interfere together to give you uh, an evanescent wave and this open the band gap. And when you open the bond gap, you have to, when alpha become higher and higher, you open the bond gap, uh, which is at some frequency. And in this bond gap, what you know is that because of all these partial reflection that interfere together, nothing is going in the medium. And uh, K is a complex number, but K here, has only one possibility as a complex number, it's imaginary of K, which become positive, that is to say, this is an evanescent wave. You cannot give energy, energy conservation, uh, make that uh, what is going in the crystal is killed because everything is uh, reflected uh, in the backward direction. Now, if you work in time, uh, you have also now, the frequency modulation in time, grand omega. And you have also the block theorem that tell you now that if you look K, K is uh, periodic in omega every G. And you have a solution which is also a plane wave, but where omega can become a complex number. And here it's a periodic function. 
And now you have this structure, which is nearly the same, but the other structure, uh, if I put C equal one, and, uh, but in this case, now uh, the bond gap are in the K domain, that is to say there is some value of K for which uh, you have now opening the bond gap. And now what is interesting is that in this bond gap, the time reverse wave, which is reflected wave, plus the forward wave, they can interfere by the mechanism I show you, which is parametric amplification, and they can interfere and go. And uh, this gives you imaginary of omega k that can be positive. And this is what happened, and you have parametric amplification. This is classical, people know this time material. Now, uh, if I come back, on my space-time diagram, here I can have an interface in space, an interface in time. I can put this periodically in space or periodically in time. Uh, this is what I described. But now I can have also any shape for my uh, in the space-time diagram. I can create uh, a moving refractive index that move uh, uh, in one block or it can move periodically, it depends what I want to do. And I want a little bit to come back on the first uh, approach, which is quite interesting. Imagine that you have a medium where there is no periodicity, but you have a medium where initially you have one part with one refractive index, another part with another refractive index, but the interference between the two medium move at some speed. It is like, uh, you have a kind of, uh, of two medium where the interface, interface between the two medium move at some velocity. And you send an incoming wave on this. And this incoming wave will see a kind of mirror, but it is a moving mirror. But it is not physically a moving mirror, it is just a refractive index that moves. And you ask, what is the reflected wave? What is the transmitted wave? And in fact, you have two regimes. Uh, first, when you are here, first you have no more spatial invariance and you have no more time invariance. You have no more energy conservation and no more wave vector conservation. You have this refractive index that moves. And if you send a wave and if the uh, interface moves at a subluminal velocity, that is to say a velocity smaller than the velocity of the uh, uh, wave you have in the two medium, what happened? In fact, if you look what happened, uh, here you begin with an incident wave that come and this wave go faster than the interface. That is to say, after some time, the wave uh, rattrap, uh, the wave interact with the interface. Uh, from an observer which is at the interface, when you receive a wave at one frequency omega one, because the observer uh, is moving, the observer has the impression that the frequency of the wave is shift down. It's like a Doppler effect. And because it will be from this interface that you could generate a reflected wave, uh, it will create a reflected wave, but the reflected wave will be sh shift in frequency uh, and uh, which has a car uh, vector uh, that correspond to the uh, in the first medium. This is a reflected wave by, the, by a moving interface. Now, for the transmit wave, it's the contrary. I will not go too much on this. This is for subliminal uh, moving medium. And you can have formula that come from Doppler effect, or if you prefer Lorentz transformation, if you are in relativity, that give you the shift. Uh, that you have. You have no more conservation of omega and k, and you have this. Now, there is a second case, the superluminal case. Imagine that you have a moving interface which moves very quickly uh, at a speed faster than the velocity of the wave uh, you have created before. Uh, like you call this a superluminal uh, interface, it is moving very fast. Now, when this 
moving interface come as it go faster than the wave you have in the medium it will see first the end of the wave and after it will wrap up uh, land it will and, and now if you look what happened in this case uh, when you send a wave and you have your su uh, superluminal interface it creates two waves but what is really interesting is the following uh, if you have an incident wave here a point it creates a forward wave in the second medium with uh, omega which which is different from the initial omega we have no conservation of omega but it creates also a backward wave but the backward wave in the superluminal case has a frequency which is negative what does it mean uh, a frequency which is negative the reflected wave has reflected uh, the omega it is like a time reverse wave but it is a time reverse wave with some compression and to understand this it's very nice to see this uh, uh, drawing that I put here uh, now if instead of one omega one I, I have a profile that I put as an incident wave that is to say a mixture of frequency some time profile the time profile that I have in my medium suddenly there is a superluminal medium that come and uh, that go faster than the time profile for an observer just at the interface of uh, my two medium he see first what is the last in your wave and after because it go faster it will step by step see what is the beginning of the wave and because it's created from this backward wave in fact it's created a time reverse wave because it go faster than the wave and he has the impression to see the wave in the past first and the wave in the future last and, and because of this it creates a time reverse wave and uh, depending on the velocity of the profile the time reverse wave is expanded or not expanded if your profile go at Mach 2 uh, in the case where you have a very small discontinuity of refractive index it will create a perfect time reverse wave uh, this was an idea of Rayleigh a long time ago that say that an observer moving at Mach 2 when he is going after a wave he will feel that he see the river the time reverse of the wave but and this is in fact the effect we have here when you have a purely temporal interface like I explained at the beginning if you send this was the case uh, that I show uh, with water wave if you send some profile in time the time reverse wave has the reverse profile in time with some expansion factor and if you have the double fabri perot you take care of this but now in a super superluminal case you have the same in a superluminal case when you send a profile the superluminal interface see the profile reverse in time with some expansion factor and because of this the temporal interface or superluminal interface has the same property they can have time reverse wave and if now if you go to Fabri Perrault uh, of this kind you can have time reverse wave and you can have parametric amplification and this makes that it is very different in this regime the three case subliminal luminal superluminal they give you very different uh, dispersion diagram and as uh, Julio show uh, if you go now with the uh, <coughs> wave equation with an epsilon that can have a g or an omega there are many cases which are possible g equals zero omega equals zero or g and omega like you want and you know that now uh, if you have for example a profile like this epsilon one plus this you have an average velocity for the wave which is c1 but you have also a velocity of wave that can have a minimum value and a maximum value that depend of alpha the strength of your modulation 
And now, uh, if you play alpha going towards zero, you know that depending if I am just with omega equal zero space modulation or temporal modulation, I have this for my dispersion diagram. But now what I have is that this, the dispersion diagram when I have G and omega related uh, together through velocity of my interface, uh, I have a new uh, dispersion relation uh, because now the periodicity of the dispersion relation is this small vector when G and omega are different. Uh, now I can build new dispersion. And when I arrive in what we call the luminal regime, and in the luminal regime, it is <clears throat> when the velocity of your modulation profile uh, is between these two values, uh, because way the wave can go between this speed and this speed and this speed, I am in the luminal regime. And when I am here, uh, <clears throat> I can go first the subliminal regime. In the sub subliminal regime, I keep spatial reflection. If I keep spatial reflection, it means that in the subli subliminal regime, my new dispersion relation is rotated uh, because of the new periodicity that I have here, but my bond gap will be bond gap of spatial reflection. These are bond gaps that give rise only of evanescent waves. And in the subliminal regime, I cannot have amplification uh, due to my profile on a wave that I will set. If I go to the superluminal regime, I explained you that in the superluminal regime, the reflection <coughs> are time reflection because I can get time reflected wave. And because of this, uh, now my opening of bond gap are vertical bond gap, like the car bond gap, uh, which are what people call unsub bond gap because here I can have parametric amplification. And in these two regimes, in this regime, I can have parametric amplification because uh, my grating is moving at a superliminal velocity. It is like I am in the temporal regime. Here, all subliminal, it is like you are in the spatial regime. And between the two, you are in the interesting regime that people call the sonic regime. And between the two, uh, if you are a mathematician and if you play block theorem, uh, if you try to look in the block theorem, the cascade of harmonic, spatial, and temporal harmonics, the cascade does not converge. If you are with the velocity of your modulation compared to C1, uh, which is included between these two values, uh, this was uh, what I call the luminal regime. In this, the block theorem does not converge. And you have to understand what happened in this regime. And in fact, in this regime, uh, because the, relation, the dispersion relation is no more a very periodic uh, object where you can have bond gaps which are or horizontal or vertical, you are in a regime where if you put as an incoming wave omega zero, you will have a cascade because you have only this possibility in the luminal regime, you will have a cascade of uh, changing, uh, of creating wave with new frequency and new k vector, both in this direction and in this, in this direction. And uh, from an incoming wave, which is at one frequency, you will create a cascade of wave uh, going in forward direction, uh, along this, but with different frequencies. And this can be also understanding in the following way. Imagine that your profile is moving at this velocity C1. If you are in, uh, when a wave with some frequency is incoming in this profile, uh, if you look in the co-moving co frame, what happens? Uh, you have your oscillation uh, of epsilon in this profile. And if you look the refractive index on 
just a G distance, uh, you have a refractive index, which is like this in the co-moving profile. And imagine that when the refractive index is negative, it means that the velocity, the local velocity of your wave is higher. When uh, you are in this regime, the local velocity of your wave is smaller. And imagine that you have a distribution of electric, electrical field that can have some oscillation here. Uh, this distribution, because it see uh, two different velocity, in this case, because C uh, is higher, the profile uh, moves like this, and this part, the profile moves like this. It means that this distribution of electrical field will be compressed. In this part, uh, it will be the contrary. The distribution of your electrical field in time will be depressed. And if you think of this, in fact, what happens in the luminal regime is the following. You send uh, a unique frequency in your luminal gratings, and in it, you will have a compression uh, of your wave field. It is like you are generating harmonics that make something more compressed in time, and you have zone where the field is depressed. And you can ask, what is the energy that I have in this profile compared to the energy that I have here? And now what is interesting is that here I present only the amplitude. And I see that the number of lines that I have here, now the number is compressed here, which means that I have a kind of amplification because all is compressed in small time. And here it's the contrary. I have less line. But if I look the energy, which is the square of this, the total energy that I will have will be more bigger than this. That is to say, I have an amplification of energy when I go through a luminal gratings. And of course, it will depend how big is my luminal grating. If I have a grating made of only uh, <coughs> 10 oscillation or 1,000 oscillation, and the number of this oscillation will be the key. And in fact, this is the process that Pendry and uh, co worker describe uh, in their uh, article. And what is interesting is that here, to be sure that it is an effect which has nothing to do with parametric amplification, they even look what happened in a medium where not only epsilon is varying uh, in, in space-time, but mu. And they were doing this uh, with double uh, oscillation of epsilon and mu, which are perfectly the same to make that z, the impedance, is perfectly constant in space and time. And they show that even if there is no possibility of bond gap, because there is no more reflection of wave, when you are at the luminal velocity uh, from any pattern, you can increase your pattern and it depends of, of uh, how many, uh, what is the size D uh, compared to the number of oscillation you have, which depend of G. And they found that it is a mechanism of amplification. I will say it is a nice work, but if you read carefully all paper, this was uh, discussed uh, relatively like this in quite old paper. And somewhere here, it is a mechanism, it is <coughs> a mechanism that is not far from the way you create a shock wave uh, in, uh, in physics. Uh, except the shock wave may be created by the nonlinear mechanism, but here it is not a nonlinear mechanism, it is a parametric mechanism. Epsilon and mu are changing in space time, but <coughs> parametric, <coughs> sorry, parametric mechanism and nonlinear mechanism in some cases give the same result at the end. 
Uh, I think, well, I, I will conclude on this. I have tried to, to give you uh, uh, an idea of the physics which is behind this. Uh, and now I am ready to answer to any question.